to you. <laughs> anyway, um, Easter Sunday. This morning I want to preach on what could happen because of Easter Sunday. If you have your Bible with you, please switch it on and go to Acts chapter 9. What could happen because of Easter Sunday? I have a friend, uh, Acts chapter 9, if you're still wondering there, Acts chapter 9. I have a friend, actually I haven't seen him in a few years. Um, his name is Charles. And uh, he's just a friend uh, in Zimbabwe. He uh, used to go to the school that my brothers were attending, private school. And I was working at the school and kind of just someone that, you know, lived down the streets. We got to meet him, spend lots of time with him. Uh, we would play touch rugby together. That's like football, but better. Um, jokes, you know. Whew. Um, <laughs> Amen. Um, and yeah, we'd hang out a lot. Uh, he uh, was always kind of just around. We had really good times with him and uh, yeah, good moments. But he would kind of come to church, kind of didn't. Uh, he ended up, he's a smart guy, so he graduated from high school, went and studied in uh, Europe, did computer science, and uh, he was coming back from a break doing university studies um, one year, and uh, his mom had been really ill, and uh, as he came back, she actually passed. It was a really hard time, obviously, um, but it was amazing that we could be there for him, and um, anyway, it's just one of those guys that's in your life, and, uh, and he knows what I believe, but I always knew that Jesus just hadn't taken a grip of his heart yet, and uh, and I remember driving home with him one night, drop, giving him a lift home uh, at his uh, house. Uh, his mom had passed and not, anyway, and we're at, his, at, the, at the gate. And I just felt God say, go for it, dude. Just go for it. Just be direct. And I just said, Charles, dude, what do you believe about God? And, uh, and it was, you know, we were good friends. So he just said, you know what, Yanku? I just can't trust. I can't trust that this is real. And I can't trust that God is good. And uh, anyway, it was probably another hour of us sitting in the car just chatting, of me just trying to, to prove to him that, man, I believe God is good. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in people's lives uh, all around me. And hey, Charles, God is good. Um, maybe, maybe you're in the same boat this morning the boat that Charles has found himself in. You've heard about God and religion. Uh, you know the God of the Bible, uh, but do you know that he's good? And so uh, this morning, that's what I want to look at. Uh, and I want to look at a guy called Luke uh, and uh, what, how he addressed this, because he wrote Acts, and a very similar question was asked to Luke by a guy called Theo. Theo Theopolis. Uh, we don't know if this guy Theopolis was saved or not, uh, but he said to Luke, hey Luke, I've heard about this God that sent his son to die for us. Go and find out if it is true. Could this God be good? And so I'm going to steal a page of Luke's genius. And this is what Luke did. He found stories. He found testimonies. He tried to go and find undeniable evidence of a life that came face to face with a resurrected Jesus. And I want to show you just how good God is. Just what could happen because of Easter Sunday. We're going to jump straight in and I want to look at Acts 9. We're going to look at quite a few verses, but I want you to read with me. And I want to pick up on how the resurrected Jesus influences our religion, our relationship, and our redemption. And so we're going to read from Acts 9, uh, verse 1. Now Saul was still breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord. So just take a breather there. Saul is going to later change his name to Paul. So if I make the mistake of Saul and Paul, just forgive me. And so it says that he, I was, uh, later on it says uh, that uh, when talking about how he 
breathe this murder against the disciples. He later on says in the Bible, I was violently opposed. I was raging with fury. I was so obsessed with hunting down and destroying Christians. We read that. That's the language he uses when he talks about that's the mindset he was in. He would trace them to foreign cities and drag them into prison. Verse 2 says that he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there that who belonged to the way, whether uh, man or woman, uh, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So the way, that's referring to people who believed in Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, the fact they believed that Jesus had come, died, and had risen. So the soul would run to the synagogues to drag them out, put them in prison, prison so that later they would be executed like their Savior. Husbands, wives, children, he would uh, destroy families, humiliate them, and uh, you know, get them to be executed like they, Jesus had been executed. In verse 3 it says, As he neared Damascus on his journey... Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They had heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Three days. And I think he was just processing what God had done. And so for time's sake, we'll just skip ahead to verse 17. Uh, Ananias shows up on the scene, someone that has been following Jesus. And he says, and Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hand on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me uh, that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And Saul spent several days with the disciples at in Damascus. And look at this, it says immediately. So he had gone to Damascus to arrest people, to execute them, but instead something else happens. It says, and because of Easter Sunday, because of the Jesus he encounters, immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. What can happen because of the resurrection? When all of what God did on the cross through Jesus and through raising him from the dead is brought to bear on our, the religion in our lives, the relationships in our lives, and the need for redemption in our lives, what happens when we come face to face with the resurrection Jesus? So let's firstly take a look at re the religion in our lives. In verse uh, 5, he asks this question. We see, he says, he encounters his flashing lights and he says, who are you, Lord? Now, I don't know if you know this, but Luke actually wrote uh, Acts, the book of Acts in Greek. Okay, and so the Greek word there is three letters. It's T-I-S, this. And uh, he's just saying that um, that Greek word can mean different things. Okay, it can also mean who are you? Uh, it can be used, what are you, as well as to what end? How is it that you are Lord? How is it that you are Lord? And it is used, I quote from a dictionary, it says that it is often used, this word this is often used to convey utter incomprehension. Utter incomprehension. So here you have someone um, that is actually... Um, Saul was an Israelite elite. He was a really, really smart guy. You know, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Um, I've said in the past here that the, the rigorous kind of upbringing 
to get to a place that he would find himself in now is it's incredible. You know, at the age of five, he would have started to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. Okay, I don't know if you've read those. I think I've read them like once through because it's a hard read. This guy was starting to memorize it, okay? Uh, that's the kind of aptitude that he would have to have. And then if he was able to do that, not comment on it, just memorize it, okay? By the age of 13, they would know the whole Old Testament, okay? Memorize it, okay? Be able to quote it and then discuss it. That's the kind of person we encounter here. Um, and, uh, yeah, at the age of five, I mean, if I think back in my life, I was probably just learning how to, you know, put steak on a stick on an open flame and be like, does this taste good? Um, or kick a rack people. Um, but here's a man, this is the kind of regiment that they were brought up in. Um, and they weren't just required to memorize the entire Old Testament. They were required to know it to be able to argue it, and I think most importantly, live it. So when we're talking about Saul here, and he's saying, who are you, Lord? Utter incomprehension. He knows the entire Old Testament in his mind. There's prophecies after prophecies of this man he's encountering, this God, and he doesn't know what's going on. We're talking about a guy who is exhibit A on holiness, holy living. And he does not know what to do with the risen Christ. Why? Because that's what happens when we come face to face with the resurrected Jesus. He destroys the religion in our lives. Unless you have come face to face with the resurrected Jesus, you'll still think there's value in religion. You'll still think there's value in rules, in regulation, in how we behave, in what I believe. And may I also add things like upbringing. You may think that that's where you place your, and find your value. Maybe good upbringing or bad upbringing. We can play, be victims of our past. Well, we can, when we come face to face with the resurrected Christ, he strips all of that away. And you know what happens to Saul? You know, he writes Romans, uh, and he writes most of the New Testament. He's writing all these letters and the rest of the New Testament, and he counts it all as lost. That's what he says. He writes it. All of these things, all the, memorizing the whole Old Testament, doing all these things, I count it all as lost. All my religious to-dos, he says. And instead, he says this, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You want to know the requirements today, what it is required of us? What is, when I think back at my conversation with Charles, what is required to enjoy the goodness of God? What it means to be a Christian? It's not to do the do's and the don'ts. It's not rules or regulation. It's not religion. It is simply calling on the name of the Lord. He has done it on the cross. He's got the seal of approval from his father, and he has been raised from the dead. And this is the first thing we see God going after when you come face to face with the resurrected Jesus. Uh, uh, just this whole idea of religion and, and soul struggle and letting go of that reminded me of a guy, his name was John Bunyan. He wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. And a uh, great book, one of the best-selling books. Um, and in it, he basically just tells a similar story. It's almost like just the allegory to this whole struggle that Saul would have found himself in. And even, he even compares it to his own life, um, carrying this burden of not being able to be set free by the works and the deeds of life, even doing it for Christ. Um, and so uh, then, then he, he talks in his autobiography about how he encounters Christ and he's just completely set free, just like Saul was set free, just like Martin Luther was set free and the great reformation started. Um, he trusted in what Christ had done because he came face to face with Jesus. 
And uh, John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, he gets arrested for starting to preach the gospel. Uh, and he, he just starts preaching it. And he, he gets thrown in prison. And they say to him, listen, we'll put you here for three months. And then we'll come back and check up on you. And, uh, and after three months, we'll ask you if you are be willing to stop preaching. And uh, anyway, he was in there for 12 years. And every three months, are you going to stop preaching? resurrected Christ, and he said, I can do no other. Until eventually, the king probably just kicked, the king kicked him out because he was turning the prisons upside down. But he writes this uh, about his encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and I've got the quote up there. It says, one day I was passing through a field when suddenly I thought of a sentence, and that sentence was, your righteousness is in heaven. Now, righteousness is uh, a term we often use when we talk about our relationship with God. It is just means that we are, have a right standing with Him. Uh, because of our sin, we can't enter the presence of a holy God. And uh, we needed to be made right with God. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so it says, your, it says, your righteousness, he thought of the sentence, your righteousness is in heaven. John, your righteousness is in heaven. And it says, with eyes of faith, I saw Christ, the resurrected Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father. I suddenly realized that there was my righteousness. So wherever I was, or whatever I was doing, God could not say about me that I did not have righteousness, for I was standing there next to him. His righteousness was found in Jesus. His worth was found in Jesus. And uh, I just, I love how he kind of ends it. It says, I also saw that it is, was not my good feeling that made me righteous, my righteousness better, and that my bad feelings did not make my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday and today and forever. And that's from Hebrews 13. So when we come face to face with the risen Christ, just like Saul did, he destroys our religion. He turns it into dust because none of that counts. Jesus has done it all. Relationship or oh, religion, relationship, and redemption. So what about relationship? In verse uh, 3 of Acts 9, it, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This is Jesus leaning over and saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And now I don't know about you, but when I read this story, uh, Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting Christians. He didn't arrest Jesus. He was arresting Christians. But Jesus asked, why are you persecuting me? And I think somewhere in there, in the three days when he was just wrestling after what had happened to him, uh, the utter incomprehension of the situation he finds himself in, I think he started to realize that if I touch them, I touch Jesus. And Tim Keller summarizes this, and he's a Bible scholar, and he said, when you touch the Christian, you touch Jesus. It's so profound that it shaped all the rest of Saul's life, ministry, and theology. Why? Because Christianity is not about a set of beliefs and behaviors, rules and regulation, religion, but rather a relationship infinitely deeper and richer than that. See, Saul had no idea that Christianity was first and foremost a relationship. That's what it is. It's a relationship. And one of our problems I think we can often fall into is that uh, we understand, and, but we stop at the Good Friday we understand Good Friday. We understand that Jesus died for me. But what do I do with the resurrection? What is so special about the resurrection? In John 14, I, I think John 14 is so important. It says that I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It says, wh why is that so important? Because the ultimate goal of Christianity is not heaven. It is not, oh, Jesus died for me so that I can get into heaven. No, the goal is the Father. No one can come to the Father except through me. 
Jesus died so that we could have a relationship with the Father now and forevermore. But it starts now. The ultimate destination of Christianity is not a place, it's a person. That person is Jesus. And that person wants to enjoy being in our lives today. In uh, the 1800s, uh, there was a great revival. It was called the Great Awakening. Um, and uh, it swept all across Europe, uh, UK, Wales, Ireland. Uh, thousands of people got radically saved. We have great accounts of that. Um, the men that preached in that awakening. And it's, it's, uh, it's a huge, amazing time to go and read up on. But the crazy thing is that thousands upon thousands of people were already in church during that time. They say it might have been one of the most church times. People had access to the Bible. Um, they, could sometimes, they could even re- reserve seats in churches so that people would know if they're there or not. I'm not sure exactly, but you know, get the best seat or whatever the argument behind that was. But uh, the preachers of the Great Awakening during this season, they uh, began asking a single question. But do you have Jesus? And this is what they did. They discovered uh, that they needed to meet in smaller groups, actually. Um, And that's kind of where home groups, uh, life groups started. They started these things called societies where they could meet intentionally and discover what people believe about Jesus and where they stand in relation to Jesus. And they had a set of questions that they would ask. And uh, I want to go through some of them this morning because I want to ask you, have you met Jesus? Not have you met his church, not have you been to Easter Sunday, have you been to Christmas services, you know, how no, do you, have you met Jesus and have you met the resurrected Jesus? So here are some of the interesting questions and I'll, they're at the top of the, on the screen there. And it says, the first question I think was, how real has God been to you this week? If I stop it just there, how real has God been to you this week? Not an idea, not a principle, not a, oop, oh shucks, it's Easter, let's go to the service because we need to go, we won't get invited out for lunch later. How real has God been to you this week? Yet another. How clear and vivid is your assurance and certainty of God's forgiveness and fatherly love? How real is it? We can often, I love how here it's talking about forgiveness, and that's what Jesus came so that our sins can be forgiven. But how real has that fatherly love been? That is a next step. Are you enjoying the father's love? Next question. Are you having any particular, se- uh, are you having any particular seasons of delight in God? Do you really sense his presence in your life? Sensing him loving you. Here's some about scripture. They would ask, have you been finding scripture to be alive and active? Are you finding certain biblical promises extremely precious and encouraging? Which ones? And they would listen to the answers. Where's the life? Is it just surface? Is it just, I know what to say. Or is it coming from deep within? Is there a well of life that only comes when we are in relationship with the Father the heavenly father, the God of the, that created everything. Are you finding that God is challenging you or calling you to do something through the word? In what ways? In what ways is God challenging you to live today, this week? And this one is my favorite. It says, have you been free to see and admit more ways you sin against God and others? Freed. Not where have you failed this week? Where is God trying to free you from being just a blessing to others this week? 
Uh, where is he making you more aware of sinfulness in your life, but that you can walk out and be freed from? That's the kind of questions that came out of the Great Awakening, this movement, this intentionality of saying like, is this resurrected Jesus real to me, or is it just an idea? Is it someone I give my time to twice a year, Christmas and Easter? Or is he someone that is alive in me that I live my life according to day in and day out? If you have met the resurrected Jesus, and when you look inside of you, you will see God working in you to sanctify you, to restore you, and to redeem you. Because that's what happens when we come face to face with the resurrected Jesus. And I'll ask you this again. Is some of this evident in your life? Is, is, uh, when you listen to those questions, is there an evidence of a relationship? Or is it just religion? Is it just motions? Or is it just there's nothing? There's actually nothing. I'm just going through life. When we meet Christ, He gets rid of all these areas that we fail and it, because He's completed the work on the cross. But he doesn't just leave us there. He doesn't just, you know, break the religion in our lives. He doesn't just bring us into a relationship. He actually redeems stuff. And that's the beauty that I see in Saul's life. He brings redemption. And uh, that's a big, big word, redemption. It's a chunky word. And I love it. It's a, I think it's a beautiful word in the English language. Uh, the word redemption means, it doesn't just mean forgiveness. It also means to be freed, to be released to, to be renewed, and to be restored. And I, there's stories of redemption all over in this room. Like, even just looking at the faces, the families, that I know that there's been brokenness in your past and where you're sitting now. It's beautiful. Like, we could take them and give people time to just tell the stories of how God has redeemed and restored their lives. And what is it? Is it because, oh, I came and I sat in the pew and I did what the pastor says? No. Is I surrendered and I encountered the resurrected Christ. And He doesn't just bring us into a relationship, okay? He wants to rescue us, he wants to restore us, and he wants to redeem us. And in Acts 9 verse 19, we find Saul, in Saul's story, he says, After taking some food, he regained his strength. And Saul was a disciple in Damascus for some time. He was in there for some time. And, but immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. And he proclaimed in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Remember where this man started? Murderous threats. Violently opposed raging with fury, so obsessed with destroying Christians and Christianity that he would drag families into prison and have them executed. That's where he started. And then he came face to face with the resurrected Christ and the redemptive power of the raised Jesus. What could happen because of Easter Sunday is the same Saul not only gets renamed Paul, but he plants 20 churches, approximately. He takes the gospel to the ends of the known world, and he is used to pen most of the New Testament. And I would say and argue that most of us are here from the effects of that man's life, that encounter. Which means that if you have an encounter with a resurrected Jesus, that's the stuff that happens. That's the kind of life that he's calling us into. What could happen because of Easter Sunday? Even if you've signed those divorce papers, an encounter with the resurrected Christ can redeem that broken relationship. When you think it's all lost, he can bring humility and wisdom and gentleness to your heart to fight for that marriage again. So that God can show off in your greatest pain or in your greatest shame, that he can be glorified by restoring and redeeming marriages, relationships, relationships with kids, relationships with parents, 
That's the kind of God we serve. And he wants to restore so that people can see the power of the redemptive work that Jesus does. So that we can have faith that when we see those marriages, those relationships restored, that he can do the same in my life. And when my kids see that, they will do the same thing. They will be obedient and say, yes, that's what I want. That we can raise grandkids in, in places where they have, in, can encounter the resurrected Christ. What can happen because of Easter? Maybe, maybe you feel far off this morning because of bad things that you've done, mistakes that you've made. Maybe, you know, there wasn't a plan and pregnancy happened and you just feel far or distant. You know, God restores. God doesn't see that. He doesn't say, this is the hoops that you need to jump through. He just says, come to me. Just come. Come and be. Maybe you're sitting here this morning because mom dragged you here or dad or your wife or your friend fill in the blank, drag me here. Maybe you came here because lunch, like I mentioned, the hard cross buns. But one encounter with the resurrected Christ will change your life. And this is what can happen. And so, I don't know what your view is of God this morning. I don't know where you are. Maybe you are like Saul. Religion has been the way of doing things your whole life. Or maybe you're like my friend Charles, where you just say, how can I trust that this is a good God? How can I believe this? Wherever you find yourself, I want to introduce you to the risen Christ, who destroys any need for any work or any performance or any rules or any regulation. He says, all you need is to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Christ was raised from the dead and you'll be saved. And maybe, just maybe, you're sitting here go asking yourself, is God good? Is He good? And I want to introduce you to a Savior that is good. He says, come here, have a relationship with my Father. Not rules, not regulations. Just come and be. And what can happen because of Easter Sunday? Jesus wants to break through in our religion, our relationships, and he wants to do a redeeming work in our lives. So I want to pray for us just to respond to that. So if we could just close our eyes. And if uh, there's anybody here that, that feels that they just need to, to respond to it, let's just pray together. Lord Jesus, as I, I look across this hall, Lord Jesus, I, I do think that there could be many people that are, are in the same boat as my friend Charles, God, that, that say that, God, are you good? Are you real? Can I trust you? But God, they, they are, we are in a place always, God, where we need you, Lord Jesus. Father God, thank you that you don't require anything of us but to believe in our hearts and to confess with our mouths that you are Jesus. Yeah, Father God, and I just, I just ask that if, if there's anyone in this room that just says, you know what, just a part of that message is for me. I know I do need to respond. I do need to to say yes to Jesus. There's areas of my life where I need him to, to, to do this redemptive work. I need him to restore. I need him to redeem. If that is you this morning, just in your heart, open your heart. If you want to open your hands, and just say yes. Jesus, I pray for any individual here that, that, needs, that needs you, that's saying, I want that encounter that Saul had where Lord Jesus, you come and you, you just completely restore a man's life and you, you bring it back into the plan that you've had for them. 
I just pray for, for that, Lord Jesus, for anybody that's in that place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that we know that you are, you are risen, you're alive, and you want to keep doing good work in our lives. We thank you for that, Jesus, and thank you that we can celebrate you this morning. Thank you that we can make much of you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you that you've made a way for us to enjoy God, our Father. Thank you that you made a way. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and I, I just uh, want to encourage you that uh, if you... If you are here this morning and you're just saying yes, yes, uh, yes to Jesus, and maybe you don't even know what that means, you're just saying yes to that message of hope, the message of the Resurrection Sunday, the message of Easter, chat to someone. If you need someone to chat to, grab someone here at the front, one of the elders, uh, maybe a friend if you came here. Don't, don't leave it. Grab it. And, uh, yeah, step into the life that God has for you. Um, we have hot cross buns downstairs, coffee and tea, and uh, we'd love to have you just basically eat the hot cross buns because they need to be eaten. Um, but have a great week, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks. <laughs>